Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 22 this morning. The Bible says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Here's a word that I really don't understand. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. I preached this message a couple of days ago at Grace Kids, and uh, with the exception of just one individual in this room, the rest of you haven't heard it. And I spent a long time on it, and I don't think it's the most thorough message on the topic that we're going to deal with this morning, but I do think it's the most thorough message that I have uh, written on this subject, because I have never ever preached on the ninth fruit of the Spirit, which is temperance, or for the sake of our study this morning, self-control. And when, when, when Chris asked me uh, a few months back to speak at Grace Kids, you know, I, I thought to myself, well, you know, there's going to be a topic that's assigned to me that I'm going to enjoy, you know. Uh, maybe it's, I'm going to deal with parenting or, you know, I know something about parenting. Maybe not a whole bunch, but I know something about parenting. Maybe it's going to be about uh, uh, a whole host of other topics that I could have dealt with far more exhaustively. But when she mentioned that my topic would be temperance, I thought to myself, I've got nothing in my arsenal that I've already written on that topic at all. Usually, if I'm asked to preach somewhere or teach somewhere else, I'll just go into my file of messages that I've preached over the last 10 years and say, all right, that'll deal with that issue real well. Uh, I don't, I, I, off the top of my head, when she told me this on the phone, I don't remember anything I've ever preached on that even remotely touched on this issue of temperance or self-control. And the other thing that concerned me was, wow, I'm going to actually have to write a message on this. <laughs> and I spent about three and a half to four hours almost, combined totals, uh, on Monday trying to get this message ready. And it took me all of 15 minutes to deliver it on Tuesday. <laughs> However, I'm going to expand it a little more for you this morning as we, uh, as we preach it in a church setting. Uh, but I want to I preach on the subject of temperance today. Now, the word, if you have a King James Bible, the word is temperance. Uh, the word is translated in many of the new translations as self-control. Now, there's nothing wrong with the term self-control because that is the first definition. If you get a Strong's Concordance and you look up the word temperance, uh, the first definition is self-control. There's not a problem with that. The problem is the word temperance involves more than just self-control. Just understand that there's more to the Greek word besides just self-control. I don't think there's any problem with the term self-control. For the sake of the study, that's what we'll deal with. But temperance deals with mastering your flesh. Actually mastering some of your appetites to where the appetites do not control you, but rather you control the appetites. Uh, Paul kind of talked a little bit about this. If you look over, just over in, uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, Oh, I think I've forgotten the verse here. Uh, I believe it's over in 2 Corinthians, but don't, don't quote me on this, where he basically says uh, that uh, I, I, I beat my body in subjection. Now, that doesn't literally mean that he takes a whip and beats himself, like, uh, like in the Da Vinci Code or something like that, or some Catholic priest would whip himself and scourge himself and discipline himself. But it does mean that you have to discipline your body to do things that your body should not be doing. Right. Okay? So there's more than just self-control involved here. There's mastering of fleshly appetites, and that's all a part of temperance. Uh, in the early part of the 20th century, uh, there was a women's movement against alcohol called the Temperance Movement. You can all read about that. You can Google it, Wikipedia, whatever you like to do nowadays. Uh, but the whole point of that was, was, was more than just self-control. There was the aspect of temperance, if you will. Uh, that was also uh, kind of uh, thrown into the whole... Uh, uh, the 1930s and or late 1920s, uh, where they used to have dry counties and you couldn't serve alcohol, and they had speakeasies and all that. It was all it was all about uh, prohibition, exactly. Uh, it was all about controlling those appetites. Of course, that was through a federal mandate, but nevertheless, when I was asked to preach this, I, I was really concerned because I had nothing on it. And I think the reason why I had nothing on it is because I myself hadn't mastered temperance in my life. Uh, so about now you're probably saying to yourselves, well, if you don't like the topic and you haven't mastered temperance in your own life, what could you possibly tell me this morning that would be helpful and beneficial? 
Well, don't we like to hear other, uh, other people speak on the same deficiencies we have? Yeah. Amen? I mean, we can relate when someone's speaking on an issue that, that they have trouble with. We can say, yeah, i got the same problems. And so I'm going to approach this message from that perspective. Complaining about what I haven't perfected, so in a sense, hopefully, you haven't perfected it either. And, and let me also put it this way. There are all kinds of things in our lives that we don't like and have not mastered. But that does not mean that we ought not do them and that we should not get better over time. Now here's the question this morning I have for you. Do you know why self-control or temperance is a virtue of which all people lack? Now, let me just say, I've seen some people exude more temperance than others, but nobody that I've ever met, and I've met a lot of people, can say they have mastered temperance. Do you know why self-control or temperance is a virtue of which all people lack? Here's the answer. Because having self-control and temperance in your life runs polar opposite to our sinful and selfish nature. That's right. Listen, our sinful and our selfish nature craves and desires things right now. Our sinful and selfish nature uh, craves and desires things on an everyday, moment-by-moment -moment basis. And you know what? God offers opportunity and a way of escape in those moments. The problem is, as I preached a few Wednesdays ago, I don't think we're actively looking for the way of escape as opposed to the excuse for why we succumb to it. Self-control, the notion of it, runs totally polar opposite to our very sinful and our very selfish nature. And you cannot but watch a television program, even watch these dumb uh, talk shows. Uh, there's that spinoff from Jerry Springer, that Bilko. What's his name? I don't mean Sergeant Bilko. That was from the old Phil Silver show. But I mean that Steve Bilko or whatever that guy is. And they got all those people. I don't know if they're paid or whatever. You know, they're throwing chairs across the, uh, across the stadium thing there, the little, the little scene. And they're doing, all, listen, there's no self-control. You watch movies today, people are not practicing self-control. In fact, let me be honest with you, I think the world today manifestly actually applauds when you don't have self-control. Right. They think it's normal that you give in and you practice something that everyone else is doing as opposed to looking different and making them feel bad about themselves and doing something that is more biblical. And if you'll notice, if you have a Bible, that temperance is one of nine fruits of the Holy Spirit of God. Now you'll notice it says in verse 22, and this is very important, it says, but the fruit of the who? Spirit. Now you'll notice that the S there is in capital letters. It's a capital letter. Meaning that this is a fruit of the Holy Spirit of God. And most of us in this room have no problem with eight out of the nine fruits of the Spirit. We might have a little bit of a hitch up, a hiccup when we get to long suffering. But when it comes to the ninth fruit, self-control, temperance, we all get a little stuck from time to time because we're faced with issues daily that allow us to practice this ninth fruit. Now this morning I want to give you a few things from God's Word that I hope will help us to be better at and to better understand this ninth fruit of the Spirit that we refer to this morning as temperance or self-control. The first thing I want to bring to your attention is number one, if you're writing things down, obviously then you might as well write it down so I can never preach this again, but number one, Self-control, as the text suggests, is a fruit. Self-control is a fruit. In other words, you must bear it. Everyone got that? It's a fruit. So you've got to bear fruit. Apple trees bear apples. At least we hope they do. Orange trees bear oranges. Cherry trees bear cherries. 
And Christians, according to the text, should bear love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Or, at least they should. And like fruit, you will have seasons and I will have seasons when the picking is good. And there will be seasons when the picking is less than good. There'll be some moments what, when you, you think you've mastered your appetites, when you think, wow, boy, that problem I had with this particular situation, it seems like I've gotten the victory over it the last few times. I guess I'm over it now. And then the devil comes along, throws a monkey wrench into your life, and you realize just how dependent we are and should be upon the Lord. Amen. Now you understand that even though you, you've had maybe two or three or four or five or six or seven victories over a particular thing in your life, doesn't mean the devil doesn't come along and tweak it a little bit to where you might bite the bait in another way. Right. You know, it's interesting. The, uh, last night my wife and I were having an interesting discussion with my son. I wasn't really in the mood to discuss it, but Rita was. But nevertheless, we were having this conversation, and Jerry was talking about some things, and I remember, he remembered something, that, an illustration I gave him. And he brought it up last night, and I was just totally floored he remembered it. And I was talking about temptation. And, and, and he gets so down on himself, and he says, oh, I just, I hate my flesh. And he says that. Really, does he say it? I hate my, I just hate my flesh. You know what? Every one of us need a little dose of Jerry in here. You need to walk out of here saying, I just hate my flesh because it, it, he he <coughs> he listens to it like you do and last night he was recounting something that had to do with his flesh and he says it's just like dad told me about about the the devil is the fisherman and he has the fishing pole and he throws the bait down and he always puts something real interesting on the hook and 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 if it and if we as christians if we bite it then then it's our fault of course he i did it a little more eloquently than that but you know and, and I, it floored me because he remembered that. And I said, listen, the temptation, son, is not sin. The presentation of it is not sin. As I mentioned a few Sundays ago, if it was, then Jesus Christ would have been a sinner because he was presented with sin, blatantly speaking in Luke 4, three different times. I'm sure plenty more times. But those are the three that are illustrated for us. And obviously, the temptation... The presentation of that sin was not a sin in and of itself. And I told Jerry, I says, now son, just because the devil throws the hook down and he puts a temptation on there that is clearly marked for us, that doesn't mean that we have to bite. We need to practice something known as self-control. And he recounted it last night and just totally floored me. I'm like, man, I gotta, I gotta watch out. <laughs> He quotes the good things and the bad things, you know. But listen, there will be seasons in your life and in mine when it seems we've gone, we've got this thing down pat. And then there will be seasons when there is so much put on your plate that we get to the point where we just can't hardly bear it. And that's the point of bearing fruit. Self-control is a fruit and that means you must bear it. And may I also say that not only is self-control a fruit, but it's a fruit of the Spirit. Meaning, if you're not in and walking in the Spirit, how do you possibly bear it? You just don't, well, I'm just going to start bearing these fruit. You can't bear these fruit if you're walking in the flesh because a few verses before these are stated, it talks about the works of the flesh. And most of the time, we're proudly reveling in those. Right. Look at verse number 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, meaning that they are very open, blatant. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, as President Bush would say, fornification, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murderers, drunkenness, and revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you, uh, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he contrasts those works of the flesh with the fruit of the Spirit. It is interesting, by the way, that to the unsaved man, it's a work. 
a work of the flesh. But if it's something that's in of the Spirit, it's a fruit. Interesting? When you exude work, it's a weariness on your flesh. Amen. I mean, come on, some of you guys are blue-collar. You do a, a eight, eight or nine hours a day, you know, ten hours a day out there, and you're doing construction, or you're doing whatever, it's a weariness. Oh, yeah. I mean, you just go home, and you don't want to do nothing, you just plop down and go to bed. <laughs> you know, honey, bring the food, and I'm done. <laughs> Work is a weariness to the flesh. There's not one thing on that list on the works of the flesh that will make you feel good about yourself. It's a weariness. The point is, it's to, make you, it's to beat you down. Right. It's to make you feel heavy and, and heavy laden. The point is to make you feel disgusting. But the fruit of the Spirit is totally opposite. Because I don't know about you, if you present two options in front of your children, vegetables or fruit, guess what? You're going to work to get them to eat the vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> but you're, odds are you're not going to work to have them eat that fruit. Last night we had asparagus. Jerry's not an asparagus fan. <laughs> Me, I can just eat those things, dip them in some hollandaise sauce, and oh, I just love them. They do, however, leave an interesting odor. But nevertheless... Uh, <laughs> Come on! I, I, according to what I have heard, that's actually a good thing. I don't know. Whatever. I'm not into asparagusology this morning. But anyway, but but I put a piece of cake, put a piece of cake in front of Jerry. Not a problem. No work involved at all. He just goes to town on that. Listen, self-control is not only a fruit, but it's a fruit of the spirit. Number two. Self-control is related to, if you think temperance is a bad word, you're going to hate this one. It's related to patience. In other words, you must bear it. The other bear. Now, when I think of patience, I am automatically drawn to an earthly example and to a heavenly example. My earthly example is Job. My heavenly example is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In the book of James, we are told to, quote, consider the patience of Job. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, when God, through the Holy Spirit of God, tells you to consider somebody, evidently there must be somebody, something in that man's life we ought to consider. That's right. And think about it. Even though Job was a sinner, I mean, he wasn't sinless, and God wasn't saying that in Job 1 either. No. He was a sinner just like you, and just like me. However, he had a relationship with the Lord that allowed him to endure and bear things that were frankly tragic that most of us would have flunked at before we got to Job 4. I want you to look at Job real quickly. Keep your finger in Galatians. Go to Job chapter 1. And I've given you uh, this list before. Obviously, you've seen it before because it's in your Bible. Uh, but I want you to notice this. For those of you who haven't seen it before, Job chapter 1, verse 13. Now again, there's nothing in Job's life that God wanted to punish him for. There's nothing in Job's life that God said, you know what, uh, I think you need all this hell broken down upon your life. It wasn't anything like that. But in Job chapter 1, verse number 13, the Bible says this, And there was a day, and by the way, look up here, there's going to come a day in your life too. There's going to come a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing, the asses were feeding beside them, and the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen upon, uh, from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters, were, they were eating and drinking and their uh, wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young men and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job reacted in the way that I would not have reacted. Then Job arose, rent his mantle, shaved his head, fell down upon the ground and worshipped. Mm -hmm. Amen, 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 amen. Listen, man. He just, uh, just got news 
that he had suffered the loss of his property. And then as soon as that news came to him, someone else ran up to him and said, you just suffered the loss of your children. Amen? I mean, when it rains, man, it pours. It's not trials. It's a trial. It's trials. Amen? Amen. I mean, they, it comes at you fast and furious. The point is, the devil fills your plate so far that one of two reactions is going to happen. You're either going to shave your head and worship, or you're going to give in and say, you know what? God must be against me. <coughs> Job suffered the loss of his property. He suffered the loss of his children. If you read into Job chapter 2, he suffers the loss of his health. And you read into Job chapter 2 verse 9, he suffers the loss of his wife. You say, did his wife physically die? No, but she might as well have gone ahead, go, ahead, go ahead and died. Verse 9. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? You know what his wife was saying? What in the world are you still worshiping God for? Why are you still worshiping God? You've just lost the children. You've lost the property. You've lost your health. He's sitting there with a potsherd. Uh, scraping himself because he's got these boils on his body. Which, by the way, when the devil, when God allows the devil to put a boil on your body, I guarantee you it ain't like a common zit. Right. I mean, this has got to be bad. Yeah. I mean, this is something that, uh, you know, uh, uh, whatever medication they got in the market is not going to take care of. All I can say is this, it must have been miserable for Job. Yeah. And his wife looks at him and says, why are you still maintaining your integrity? Why don't you just curse God and die? Which evidently, those are the kind of friends she must know. Because yeah. that's how they react. And then, of course, the, the, the Job says, those, one of the most famous statements in the Bible, he says in verse 10, but he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. Meaning, evidently, this is something that is common. <laughs> what? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? That's right. And then it says this, In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. And then I heard some fool preacher say, well, that didn't mean he didn't sin in his mind. Well, you idiot. You had to think it in order to say it. Amen? The point is this. I don't think Job sinned at all. Right. You say, well, he had every opportunity to sin. You're right. He could have reacted very bitterly at God. Right. And if you keep going through this book, you'll find three friends that commiserate with him. Eliphaz and some other guy and this other guy named Buzzy. I mean, it's, it's a messed up... Uh, messed up... Uh, crowd of friends, and, and, they're, and you know what? It's interesting. If you read through the book of Job, now this is a side note, has nothing to do with the rest of the message, this is good study for you, read the 42 chapters, and you will see a study in modern charismatic theology. You say, what do you mean by that? One of his friends say, the reason why you're going through this, there must be sin in your life. Read a couple chapters later. Well, there must be something. There must be something going on for, for God to just, you know, rain down judgment from heaven. If you read chapter 1, nothing happened in his life. Right. Yeah. One that feared God and eschewed evil That's right. said to the devil, Have you considered him? Ain't no one like him. Right. God said that. So his three friends were wrong. Or at least one of his three friends were totally wrong. But you know what's funny? That philosophy... Of there must be something in your life sinful, that's why God's doing this, is permeating charismatic theology today. Turn on channel 40 or one of those church channels or, you know, whatever they got, you know, the Jesus channel. Whatever they've got today, and you, you, you see some of those charismatic quacks, and they'll say, the reason why God is blessing me is because I don't have any sin, and the reason why God's not blessing you is because you've got a hidden sin that you haven't confessed. <laughs> There was no hidden sin. By the way, that philosophy carried over into the Pharisees in the book of Matthew, who were the religious rulers in Christ's day. Do you remember when, uh, we, when they were talking about that, uh, that child that was born lame, that man that was born lame, and the Pharisees came to Christ and said, who sinned first, right, huh? the parents or him? Uh -huh. The point is, because it was the, if it was the sin's parents, it carried over to the, to the kid, therefore he was born lame. Right. And Jesus said, neither. Right. What's the point? Job's friend's charismatic theology carried over to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees carried over to the modern charismatic today. Right. Side note. That's just a side note. But here's my point. By the time we get to the end of Job's life, God restores everything back to Job. In fact, God gives him back double. Amen. Job had to bear it in order for God to give him a happily ever 
When I think about patience, not only do I think about an earthly example in Job, but I think about the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, he patiently endured three different temptations from the devil. You know what? The temptations you face aren't even from the devil. They're from his minions. The devil is not omnipresent. And we're all, well, the devil, you know, blah, blah, the devil. The devil had nothing to do with it. His minions may have had something to do with it. But the devil had nothing to do with it. This, these are three temptations he got straight from the devil himself. I'm not getting in the ring with him. In Luke 4, and, and by the way, he comes out shining in the end. Jesus Christ patiently stood before Pilate and the Pharisees as they hurled one false accusation after another, and the Bible says he just stood there. He patiently endures the mocking of the crowds as they yell, crucify him, crucify him, and they let loose a convicted criminal That's right. named Barabbas. That's right. He patiently endures the scourging and the beatings and the taunting of the Roman soldiers. Remember, they would put a thing over his head and they would smack him. They'd say, hey, prophesy who, the, who hit you. Yeah. Right. Basically just mocking, saying, oh, if you're the king of the Jews, then you'll know this. And then, of course, when he's on the cross... He has to then deal with one of the thieves who was there for a good reason yes. and says, you know, if you're, you know, get, get us all down from here if you're who you say you are. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ is the picture of patience and self control, for he, as he is hanging on the cross, bloodied and beaten, he proclaims something that I would never proclaim Father, forgive them. Right. You know what that tells me? He's in full control of himself. Amen. No matter what he had just gone through, and it must have been physically exhausting, not only painful to boot, but the relenting crowds and, and the jeers as he was walking that cross down the Via Dolorosa and being spit upon and, 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 and all the things that he had to endure must have been physically and mentally exhausting. But you know what? He had full control. When he looked down and had pity upon them, those Roman soldiers and just forgive them, Lord. They don't know what they do. Self-control is related to patience. Therefore, <coughs> you and I must literally bear it. Thirdly, self-control is part of a whole. Go back to Galatians chapter 5. Self-control is part of a whole. In other words, you must bear all. I mean, what I mean by that, preacher? Now, if you'll notice in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23, that self-control is the ninth or the last of the fruits of the Spirit. That means there are eight fruits that precede it. Everyone got that? If you will, self-control is part of a whole. You and I cannot pick and choose which fruits you want to bear at any given occasion. Well, I think today, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and just, I'm going to do love. I think today I'm going to practice a little bit of gentleness. I'm going to bear a little bit of, of meekness today. Or I'm going to, yeah, that's real meek of you. You know, I'm going, to, I'm going to practice a little bit of that. Listen, let me tell you this. There's love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and then temperance brings up the rear. You know, you know why I think that list is just like that? Let me tell you why. Because I think you need the other eight in order to achieve that ninth one. Amen. I think you need to start off with love because the Bible says God is love. Amen. You start off with that highest virtue and then work your way down to that ninth one because you're going to need those eight in order to get that ninth one. That's right. But you know what we do? We pick and choose. Somebody might say, well, I'll just work on self-control because I need some work in that area of my life. Have you ever thought that you might need work on the first eight so you can have a strong and sturdy foundation on which to build on so you can mess around with that self-control one? You know what we do sometimes? We place the cart literally before the horse. It's like putting a puzzle together but missing some of the pieces. You know, we're all, we got, a, we got a thousand piece puzzle, which by the way, I would never sit down and do. I don't know, understand you people. That get there and get a, you got your own little table and it's over here in the little corner and you sit down there and you get away from everybody and you got a thousand piece, but little puzzle pieces like that. And then you're, look, you're doing all the little borders, and you're doing this, and I sit there and go, you know, I like big strong windows, blow that off the table. <laughs> Mess you all up, man. 
I don't have any patience for that. But can you imagine somebody that's methodically putting a thousand piece puzzle, two thousand piece puzzle together, and you're missing the last piece. <laughs> Guess what? You're not getting self-control until you practice the other eight. Because it's all part of a whole. <laughs> self-control is part of a whole. You must bear it all, not just the ones you want. And then lastly, self-control begins with a walk. And you'll notice in Galatians chapter 5, verse number 16, and in Galatians chapter 5, verse 25, that these fruits of the Spirit are bookended by walk. Notice verse number 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Look at verse number 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. It would seem that in order for me to have self-control and in order for me to practice those other eight fruits, I need to start with a walk. There's a reason why it begins with a walk in Galatians chapter 5, verse 25, uh, verse 16, excuse me, and that it concludes with a walk. I cannot bear these fruits unless I'm walking, and number two, unless I'm walking in the Spirit. Well, you might say, well, well, I'm walking with the Lord. Well, good. Let me ask you another question. Is, there, is everyone in this room walking with Him? After all, self-control, among other things, begins with a walk. It, it's a walk in the Spirit. You cannot do this. You cannot achieve any of these fruits. You cannot bear any of these fruits unless you're in and of the Spirit. You must know Him. You must actively be walking with Him. And He's got to be residing in the temple of your heart. Amen. It's impossible to achieve these fruits any other way. You might be able to achieve them, achieve them uh, in, 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 a, in a temporal way. But the way that Paul is talking about them here, the only way you can truly achieve them is by beginning with a walk. For me, that walk began at the age of 13. How about you? How old were you? Where were you? Remember the time, remember the date, remember who was there, remember what verses were read to you, remember what you did. Do you remember when you were convicted of your sin and you, you began your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ? Listen, you got to begin this walk at some point. You can't just say, well, I just got saved through osmosis. No, you did not get saved through osmosis. You must have made a choice to follow Christ and to walk with Him. And by the way, I'm still under construction. God's not finished with me yet. That's right. He's still refining. He's still molding me each day of my life. And I'm not what I should be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. Amen. Let me close with this illustration that I'm sure Chris wants to hear all over again. But sometimes God will use situations in your life, physical illustrations, and put you in them just to see if you can practice some of these fruits. Right. And once in a while, I flunk. Let me just say, rephrase that. I flunk most of the time when God puts me in a situation. But last Sunday, I was placed in a situation that was rather interesting. Greg, shut up. I got here at 3.30 on Sunday afternoon. And as my custom is, I wanted to get here before everybody and just kind of get things in order, get the coffee going, uh, maybe arrange the chairs because I'm anal and put the mints in the, uh, in the bathroom. I just want to do the things that I like to do. I just like, I want to be here alone. I want to do those things. I like that. It's me. It's weird. I know, but it's me. So I got here at 3.30 and I, I came in the little doors there that you guys go in. And, and then uh, I, I, for some reason, I don't know why, but in my mind I thought I should leave this door open. But for some reason I closed it. So I closed it. I came into the kitchen and I was about to put the coffee out and I noticed that the bread was still in there so it was almost gone so I thought well nobody's going to take any more bread so I'll go ahead and take the bread out so I went out this door to throw it in the dumpster the problem is it was windy and the wind blew this door shut so I'm now outside of the church 
and thinking, well, I'll just go around, and I realized I'd close that door. All right, so my keys and my cell phone to call someone to help me are in the kitchen. So now God is starting to actively allow me to practice some of these fruits. Okay? I begin, I begin to start thinking, oh my goodness, the preacher's going to get here, the singers are going to get here, and I am outside with nothing. I can't get them in. I can't do anything. The church is a mess. I'm going nuts physically in my mind. It's just going all around. I'm thinking, okay, what am I going to do? All right, so I get the notion. I'll just climb up this fence right here, get over the backside, go around and get up on the roof, and then jump down to the courtyard. <laughs> In my black pinstripe suit that I wore last Sunday night. So I climb over the fence, I get over here, and there's the, the, the playground equipment that was left here from the previous church before we started leasing the property. It was there. So I thought, well... There's no other way I can get up there, so I'll climb up that, and I'll jump up on the roof. And so as I did that, and I kicked my foot off, I kicked that one block off to where now I can't get back down unless I really do jump down in the courtyard. So I've kicked that off, and I look back, I'm thinking, huh, I wonder how I'm going to get back down. But anyway, so I'm up on the roof, and I'm thinking, okay, it can't be that far between the, the, the top of the roof and the courtyard. And as I'm looking down, I'm thinking, boy, that's a little further than I realized. <laughs> You know, I'm sure many of you men in here, you know, you know, yeah, that's not very far at all. But, you know, I was in my suit. I, I knew I had to slide down on my rear end and get as far down as I possibly could. I'm like, I just can't do this, man. So I'm up there, and I keep daring myself. You know, I'm going to do it now. I'm going to do it now. You know, I just, I just, I did that maybe eight or nine times. And, and I'm up there for 35 minutes before my half-savior showed up. Alois Sherlock. <laughs> so here comes this red Volkswagen pulling up. I'm like, oh, Aloy, uh, that's good. At least I'll have something to talk to. We don't have any keys. But uh, So Aloy gets up. Pastor! <laughs> don't jump. Don't jump! <laughs> don't! Gets his cell phone out. I gotta take a picture of this. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Call, calls Robin. You won't believe what's up on the roof right now. And, all the, and then the people are driving by. One guy yelled, don't jump. Some guy said, go up to the steeple, it's higher. Uh, <laughs> it's true, guy yelled that. Go up to the steeple, it's higher. You know, whatever. I'm just talking to a lawyer. You know, and, and then finally, finally after 10 minutes of enduring that, which was part of the temperance thing, yeah. Bob and Vicky show up. Bob's got keys. Bob, could you just unlock that and go get the ladder from the kitchen and put it here so I may then descend the roof. And then my episode ended. But you know what? As I was up there alone for 35 minutes, just kind of walking the roof, <laughs> wondering when somebody was going to show up, daring myself to jump, I really didn't get as mad as I thought I would. I mean, I kept thinking... Oh my goodness, what if, the, what if the singers show up? What if the preacher shows up? And I'm up on the roof. How do I can explain this one? You know? <laughs> and, and, and I realized after the fact, even though I was irritated, don't get me wrong, I, I was irritated, but I would have dealt with that situation totally differently five years ago than I would have today. I mean, I would have been so beside myself five years ago. Four years ago. Oh, four weeks ago. <laughs> than, than I would be last Sunday. But, you know, I dealt with it as, as best as I could, even though some people may have thought I was still a little perturbed, but I was not anywhere like I could have been. But here's my point. I look back at that as God purposefully putting me through it. Number one, so I could practice those fruits, and number two, so I can have a closing illustration at Grace Kids. <laughs> I honestly believe those things. I believe those things as literally as I believe this Bible is inspired. Amen. I don't believe that thing was... That was no mistake that I got trapped upon the roof of the church. I believe it was purposeful. And I'm, it was meant to whittle at me a little bit. It was meant to kind of mold me and kind of say, all right, Jerry, you know you're stupid. Now you just recognize it and just rely on me. Rely on me. And relying on me meant Bob and Vicky showing up and having keys. Self-control. I asked you the question this morning, are you bearing that fruit? You might need to start with getting the other eight down pat before you can work on that last one. 